Welcome everyone to 2019 Mises University lecture that is devoted to Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation theory of ethics. But before starting in earnest, uh, let me maybe introduce a problem that I faced while I was preparing this lecture for you. I assume that we all know the gist of uh, Hoppe's argument that people cannot argue against self-ownership rights and property rights without running thereby into performative contradiction. But in philosophy, there is a very famous question that is known as uh, the omnipotence paradox. So the question is whether God can create a stone so heavy that he cannot himself lift it. And now, you know, whatever, whatever we answer, we see that there is a problem with the concept of omnipotence. So if we, if we answer that God could not create such a stone, obviously he would not be an omnipotent being. If he, on the other hand, could create such a stone, he wouldn't be omnipotent being either, because then he would create something he wouldn't be able to, to lift. And I was actually realizing that a very similar problem can be formulated about argumentation ethics. That uh, although we know that people cannot argue against self-ownership rights, I was wondering whether God could argue against self-ownership rights without running thereby into performative contradiction. And when I was thinking about this problem, I quickly realized what is the answer to this question. And the answer is basically that if he tried, he would be the God that failed. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the first success you know, <laughs> today. Uh, well, in Poland, we don't have really this uh, sort of custom of uh, selling jokes during lectures, so I really did my best to come up with a new joke and to... Uh, so I appreci appreciate your laughter. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> encourages me a lot. Uh, so uh, maybe let me start uh, with uh, introducing the structure of my lecture. So uh, first of all, I will uh, try to set a stage for the argument. And by doing it, uh, you will, I guess, realize I'll be following, uh, in some respects, uh, two thinkers that uh, um, formulated the problem in a similar way. That is uh, Robert Nozick, on the one hand, uh, in a more uh, libertarian-friendly way and a more critical way, that was uh, uh, Gerald Cohen. And then I will present uh, Hoppe's argument, uh, as I see that in my interpretation of this argument, as a sort of solution uh, to, this, uh, to this challenge that I set uh, at the beginning of my uh, presentation. And then I will move from uh, my uh, view on my reading of, Hopper, of Hopper's uh, argument into how it was presented recently by uh, the author himself. And I think the fact that I will first introduce my reading of this argument will make uh, his uh, presentation of the argument, which is definitely more nuanced and profound philosophically than my own reading, uh, maybe more accessible. And at the end, if we have enough time, I will move to some of the main criticisms of uh, argumentation ethics that uh, have been presented uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, yeah, so without any further ado, let me start my, uh, my lecture. When Hoppe was uh, presenting his argumentation ethics in a 2016 lecture given during the Conference of uh, Property and Freedom Society, he said at the beginning of the lecture that his audience should now expect something that, unfortunately, on Saturday nights would be called deep thoughts. Uh, so uh, my goal in this lecture is to render these deep thoughts as accessible and pellucid as possible without at the same time uh, losing too much of the depth of Hopper's theory. Uh, and, uh, and I guess also, which is uh, sort of inevitable, to uh, filter his theory through my interpretation thereof. Uh, and I believe that the first step to understand Hopper's argument, to understand argumentation ethics, is to realize very simple fact that argumentation ethics is a solution to a very specific problem. And therefore, to understand, to comprehend Hopper's argument, we should first realize and understand what is the problem that this argument is a solution to. And that would be uh, preferable, in my opinion, to understand this problem in a slightly uh, broader context than maybe the, the, the argument itself would suggest that is, uh, that is appropriate. So what is this problem? Well, suppose that we live in a 
purely free market society. Imagine further that there is a critic, let's say a socialist, who complains about vast inequalities in resource distribution that, in his opinion, exist uh, in, our, uh, in our society. He thinks that the fact that capitalists and entrepreneurs hold vast resources, whereas uh, manual workers and other professions have much less, is the reason to believe that our society is deeply unjust and unfair. So he wants to know what is the justification for such distribution of resources? What is the justification for such, as he believes, discrepancies in the distribution of wealth ex existing in our society? He wants to know what gives the title to the, uh, the title, uh, what gives these uh, capitalists and entrepreneurs the title to hold these resources that they actually hold on the free market? What gives them the right to have such vast assets? Well, at least at first glance, this question does not seem to be particularly difficult to answer. Uh, we could basically say that what gives these capitalists and entrepreneurs titles to the resources that they actually hold on the, on the free market is basically the fact that they received these titles from previous owners who voluntarily and freely exchanged them for the superior services and goods offered to them by these capitalists and entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, uh, a moment of uh, reflection suffices to realize that our imaginary socialist would not be satisfied with uh, this sort of answer. If he's only slightly deeper thinker than we thought he was at the beginning, uh, he will ask a further question. He will want to know what gave these uh, previous owners the title to hold the resources that they held and then exchanged with these capitalists and entrepreneurs. And of course, we could basically sort of repeat our original answer by saying that these previous owners also received the titles from still previous owners in exchange for some services and some goods that they were willing to offer uh, to these uh, still, previous, still previous owners. But uh, it will become clear at that stage, uh, uh, both for our socialist opponent and for ourselves, that this sort of justification of the free market distribution of resources cannot go like that ad infinitum, that it must stop somewhere and that it must stop with the original holders of resources who themselves didn't receive these resources from previous owners, but who basically took them from nature. And our socialist opponent, uh, who at that stage uh, Okay, to be much deeper thinker than we probably thought at the very, <laughs> at the very beginning, will proceed with his investigations, and he would like to know what gave the, uh, what gave a right, what gave these original holders of raw materials a right to basically take these materials from nature, and at the same time, which is I guess crucial, to exclude all other people from enjoying these resources, from uh, using them or taking them. So he would like to know what is the justification for something that we would call uh, original acquisition of uh, raw materials. Well, at that stage, uh, as, you, uh, as you know, we would have uh, a few answers available to us. But I suspect that whatever the answer we would like to choose, uh, this answer will ultimately refer uh, mm, to the claim that these original holders of uh, raw materials were self-owners that they uh, had self-ownership rights, that is, that they had rights, uh, property rights to their own bodies. And therefore, by taking these natural resources from the state of nature, they created something that uh, Hopper calls an objective link between something that they already owned, that is, between their bodies and their persons, and these natural resources on the other hand, and thereby created a title to these, to these resources. Well, at that stage, of course, it will become uh, mm, obvious and clear that the entire justification of the free market distribution of resources ultimately depends on the truth of the claim that original holders of raw materials uh, are or were self-owners. And although the claim might seem and might be commonsensical and might be intuitive, uh, we might be even willing to say that the claim itself is obvious. What is more, our socialist opponent 
could uh, at least uh, at first uh, sort of take on the problem also share th this opinion with us, he will realize one further, uh, one further fact that because this is the claim that justifies the entire distribution of resources in the free market, the distribution that he thinks is deeply unjust and unequal, he will then think that there must be something problematic about this first principle of libertarian justice, that is principle of self-ownership. And he would like to know what is the justification for this principle. Or at least he will think, and I think he might be justified in this thinking, that uh, the question about the justification of this principle is due. Uh, and this is exactly at that stage that argumentation ethics makes its original contribution, contribution as I understand it. So what is this contribution made by argumentation ethics? In a nutshell, contribution is to show that this first principle of libertarian justice, that is principle of self-ownership, does not require any further justification or any further proof in a sense of being derived from some previous premises or false, from some previous theories about, uh, let's say, human nature, as Rothbard would like to have it, or from uh, some uh, claims about the nature of the world or about God, uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, or uh, any other metaphysical anthropological uh, uh, claims. Uh, because any denial, any attempt at debunking this claim, uh, debunking this first principle of libertarian uh, uh, justice, uh, would run into sort of contradiction, and therefore would could not possibly be true because nothing that is contradictory could possibly possibly be true. Uh, so we can say that the contribution, that the relevance of argumentation ethics is absolutely profound because it tries to provide ultimate, apodictic, uh, a priori justification of the first principle of libertarian justice. The principle from which we can derive all further uh, claims about uh, just property titles to the resources that in the process of the development of the society uh, uh, we, we hold or we, uh, or we might hold. So now the question would be basically uh, how this argument, how this argumentation, arg ethics argument uh, works, uh, how this demonstration that any possible denial of the first principle of libertarian justice would inevitably run into contradiction uh, would look like. And uh, to see that, to see how this demonstration operates, I would, uh, I would suppose further that this uh, original uh, holder of raw materials with whom our socialist, our imaginary socialist, is uh, arguing about the justification of the first uh, principles, a principle of libertarian justice, that is the principle of self-ownership, is Hopper. So what would Hopper's response to our socialist challenge look like? And, and please let's assume that he would uh, uh, show mercy to our socialist <laughs> opponent and uh, not call the physical removal service. <laughs> so, so what would his response look like? Well, I suppose uh, and I believe that Hopper would first of all point out that by taking an action of presenting a claim that the proposition that Hopper is a self-owner is false, our socialist opponent would thereby demonstrate that his goal is to solve the disagreement about the truth value of this initial proposition that Hobbes is a self owner in the cause of argumentation. And that would be the first step in argumentation ethics argument as I see it. The first step. A socialist goal is to solve the initial disagreement about the truth value of the proposition that Hopper has self-ownership rights in the cause of argumentation. I think what's important to realize at that stage is that this, this step uh, is, well, at least as I see that, uncontroversial and unproblematic. It is obvious that the socialist is taking an action. It is obviously that thereby he has to have a purpose. Uh, 
and that the, the characterization of this action uh, strongly suggests that this goal is to solve the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation. Well, he's already providing uh, mm, arguments, he's already providing reasons, he's already asking questions, uh, he's already suggesting that there is something wrong with, the, with this initial statement. So mm, the first step does not seem to me to be controversial at all. Second of all, I believe that Hopper would point out that argumentation is the opposite of physical force. That is, it is a peaceful, as opposite to violent, form of solving initial, dis uh, initial disagreements about the truth value of, of a given proposition, in this case, the proposition that Hopper is a self-owner, by providing reasons and giving evidence. So, the second step in the argument, as I see it, is the following. Argumentation is the opposite of violence. Now, uh, again, this step does not seem to be controversial at all. And for two reasons. First of all, if you think about any proposition, any disagreement, uh, excuse me, any disagreement about the truth value of a given proposition, let's take any silly or trivial proposition like the proposition that the Earth is round. If there is any controversy about this proposition, we immediately know that it is possible to solve this disagreement, that is disagreement whether it is the case, as this proposition says, whether the proposition is true, only by providing reasons, giving evidence, uh, developing arguments, uh, and it is just unthinkable or impossible to solve this disagreement by hitting our opponent, by threatening him, by bribing him, etc., etc., uh, so basically, argumentation is the only way in which we can solve th this type of disagreements. And second of all, I think that is also an important point. If you take any independent source, let's use this phrase. So if you take any book on rhetoric or argumentation theory or communication, uh, an important book on, on these subjects, uh, these books that don't have nothing to do with Hopper's argument, you'll see that in these books, argumentation is exactly defined as the opposite of physical force, as the opposite of violence. So I also consider this step absolutely unproblematic in his argument. Then, uh, from these two steps, in a pretty straightforward and obviously valid, valid uh, inference and reasoning, Hopper would derive, as I understand it, the, the third step of his argument. The third step would be basically com combining these two steps and, and uh, pointing out that by taking an action of, of presenting a claim that uh, the proposition that Hopper is a self-owner is false, our socialist opponent would thereby demonstrate that his goal is to solve the initial disagreement without resorting to violence against Hopper. This basically seems to me to follow from these two, from these two steps. So the third step that can be also called an intermediate conclusion is therefore in order to achieve his goal, the socialist ought to, sorry, the so, uh, excuse me, uh, in order to achieve his goal uh, mm, uh, of uh, solving the initial disagreement, uh, 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 excuse me, of course, Theref uh, therefore socialist goal is to solve the initial disagreement without resorting, without resorting uh, to violence against, against Hopper. Uh, now, uh, at this stage, we can, of course, ask a question which would be a very straightforward question. Uh, so what should socialists do in order to achieve his goal? And it will become clear to us the answer to this question will be that the socialist should not resort to violence, or in other words, that the socialist should abstain from using violence against Hopper in order to achieve his goal, the goal being of solving the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation, that is, without resorting, without, without resorting to violence. This step is actually ev it's even weird to make this step because it seems so trivial. It looks like a bit even tautological. So we would say that the step number four will be, therefore, in order to achieve his goal, socialists ought to abstain from resorting to violence against, uh, uh, against Hopper. But now, to say that the socialist ought not to use violence against Hopper in order to achieve his goal is basically to say that there is some sort of norm that forbids the socialist from using violence against Hopper. Uh, and, because so and the socialist, of course, demonstrated that this is his goal. But what is the, m the, the most important part of this realization, I think, is that, as we already uh, saw it, uh, 
in previous steps because any truth claim about any truth value, uh, about the truth value of any proposition uh, can be presented only in the course of argumentation. So this would be this, uh, this would be the socialist goal any time he would like to deny the truth of the proposition that Hoppe is a self-owner. So this is uh, unavoidable or inevitable for the socialist uh, uh, to be the case that in order to solve the disagreement in the course of argumentation, he ought to abstain from using violence against, against Hoppe. Well, but to say and I think this is the crucial point now, but to say that there is uh, a norm that forbids the socialists from the use of violence against Hoppe, to say that he ought to abstain from the use of violence against, against Hoppe is basically uh, to say that, uh, is basically to say that uh, Hoppe has a right or has a moral claim, or what, this is exactly what we understand, the, the, the word right as a moral claim, that violence is not used against him. So we can formulate the step number five. However, to say that the socialists ought not use violence against Hoppe, or to say that there is a norm that forbids socialists from, use, from using violence against Hoppe in order to achieve his goal, is to say that Hoppe has a right that the socialist does not use violence against him. Now, of course, our rights that other people don't use violence against us are properly called what? Self-ownership rights. So, uh, having made these steps, we can arrive at our conclusion in the uh, argumentation ethics argument. So, the conclusion would be that, therefore, in order to achieve his goal by solving the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation, as our socialist, imaginary socialist opponent demonstrated that it is his goal, uh, he ought to abstain from using violence, which basically means that he have to, has to recognize Hoppe's self-ownership self -ownership rights. So the conclusion, therefore, in order to present a claim that Hoppe does not have self-ownership rights in the course of argumentation, uh, yeah, which is the only way to do it. Uh, our socialist opponent has to recognize Hopper's self-ownership rights. That is, his rights that the violence is not used against him. Uh, and we can already see that it means that our socialist opponent is entangled in uh, a, a sort of contradiction, a contradiction that we normally call a performative contradiction. That is, contradiction that happens between the content of the claim and the act of making this claim, or the necessary presuppositions of the act of making this claim, or what Hoppe likes to call in his mother tongue, Bedingung der Möglichkeit, conditions of possibility of, making, uh, of, uh, of an act of making this claim. Uh, and this is exactly what happens in this case, because we see that the content of the claim is that Hoppe does not have self-ownership rights, whereas necessary presuppositions of the act of making this claim are, uh, uh, mm, uh, is recognition of Hoppe's self-ownership rights. So, uh, therefore, uh, it seems to be the case that argumentation ethics uh, provides an ultimate justification for the first principle of uh, libertarian justice, that is, for the principle of self-ownership. That is, it shows that this principle does not have to be derived from any previous uh, premises or any previous theories, because any attempt to deny this principle will run into performative contradiction and therefore could not possibly be true. Uh, so, yeah, in a nutshell, this is how I see uh, uh, argumentation ethics argument uh, working. Uh, maybe already at this stage, uh, some of you who are familiar with the, 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 the argument and who are familiar with the debate over the argument can realize that the way I presented the argument is very different from many criticisms that were presented in the literature against this argument. And I will refer to that later on uh, during my lecture. Uh, but I would like to point out at this uh, stage that these criticisms very often are uh, Misconceive, misconceive of, the, of this argument uh, presented by Hoppe. Uh, they hinge on uh, the idea that uh, 
uh, what is uh, uh, crucial in this argument is the claim that in order for me, in order to argue, I have to have some control over my body to make an argument. That might be true, but this does not seem to me to be really the main point that Hopper is making in his argumentation ethics argument. His main point is that there is sort of uh, intention in the, f in, in the fact of uh, taking an action of a specific sort on the part of our imaginary socialist and that it renders him uh, submitted to a norm that violence against his interlocutor uh, ought not to be used. And that this fact uh, actually makes us uh, to conclude that our interlocutor has self-ownership rights, that is rights that violence is not used against him. And these rights do not necessarily have anything to do with the claim whether our interlocutor has full or partial control over his body. He might have, have had that, but uh, you know, at the moment of argumentation, uh, it, it's not, it does not seem to me to be a necessary, uh, necessary uh, condition. Okay, so this is the way I see argumentation ethics. And now I think that would be uh, in order to uh, see how Hopper himself presents his argument. As I said, I think his presentation is much more nuanced and profound. It might also be more open for uh, alternative interpretations than the one I have just, I've, have just presented. But I believe that because we sort of uh, went through uh, my way of uh, understanding the argument and, and steps that I presented, it might be now easier to appreciate the depth of Hopper's original argument. So uh, let me now uh, present the argument as it uh, has been presented uh, in the last lecture, 2016, uh, given uh, exclusively uh, about this topic that is uh, argumentation ethics by Hopper himself. So Hopper's formulation of the argument. And I will comment on these steps in the meantime. So the first step uh, is basically that all claims that a given proposition or argument is true, false, indeterminate, incomplete, etc., et are raised and justified and decided in the course of argumentation. And we already can see that this point is uh, involved in uh, my first step when I uh, pointed out that the socialist is taking a specific action and that the specific action, action of uh, solving the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation is, uh, is uh, uh, unavoidable uh, uh, for him as far as ju the justification of his position is concerned. Uh, then Hoppe would say that the truth of the proposition number one, the above proposition, cannot be disputed in the course of argumentation because such a critique itself would have to come in the form of argumentation. This point, uh, this is called a, pri a priori of argumentation, and you can already see that this point is much stronger than what I did in my presentation. So Hopper says that uh, uh, the first, the first uh, uh, proposition cannot be denied uh, at pains of falling into performative contradiction, whereas uh, I said that this claim seems to me to be absolutely uncontroversial and unproblematic. So I made a slightly different point than in my presentation than, than Hopper. Uh, but I don't really think that much hinges upon this difference. Uh, then Hopper would say that would be the third step in his argumentation, ethics argument that Argumentation is not free-floating sounds, but a human action employing physical means in order to reach a specific goal, the attainment of agreement concerning the truth value of a specific proposition or argument. And again, you can see that this claim was already involved in my first step. So my first step is sort of combining two premises, uh, Hopper's first, first step and Hopper's uh, second step. From these steps, uh, Hopper would uh, move to uh, step number four, that every argumentation is a conflict, uh, is a conflict uh, free, mutually agreed upon a p and peaceful form of interaction aimed at resolving the initial disagreement about the true value of a given proposition. And this is obvious, this is our step number two, when we said that arg argumentation is the opposite of physical force, or the, the argumentation is the, is the opposite of violence. In the step number five, Hopper says, that the validity of norms that make the argumentation between a proponent and an opponent possible, uh, in which he calls praxeological presuppositions, cannot be argumentatively disputed without falling into performative contradiction. 
This might be called an uh, a priori of normative presuppositions of, of augmentation. Uh, I didn't make this step uh, because I combined it with, uh, um, with the next step uh, in which Hoppe identifies. And this, uh, this is actually the point which uh, shows what's the difference between Hoppe and his uh, um, uh, predecessors, like uh, Jürgen Habermas or uh, Karl Otto Appel. Uh, a, a philosophy of, of, uh, of these philosophers are actually, is actually uh, um, inspiration for, for Hoppe's argument. He, when he identifies what sorts of norms actually are praxeological presuppositions of any act of argumentation, because these are these are basically libertarian norms. So he says that these norms, that these praxeological presuppositions of argumentation that make argumentation possible are twofold. Each person is entitled to exclusive control of his own physical body so as to be able to act independently, etc., etc. And the second, that each person is entitled to the respective prior possessions of external resources. Uh, and another difference is already visible. I was talking only about the first uh, norm. I was talking only about the self-ownership uh, principle, whereas Hoppe is trying to justify, by his argument, both self-ownership uh, rights and property to external resources. Uh, well, in my personal opinion, uh, mm, that would be uh, enough to justify only self-ownership principle, and then because then we can basically derive uh, property rights to external resources from this principle. So, uh, so that's why I basically decided not to. Uh, not to make my argument in such a strong way as, as Hobbes made it, uh, but in a slightly, slightly weaker, uh, weaker version when I focus only on uh, self-ownership rights. Uh, mm, yeah, and the final step in Hobbes' argument is that any argument to the contrary, that is against these norms, these libertarian norms, etc., uh, etc., et will run into a performative contradiction and this is what Hoppe calls uh, a priori of property rights, or a priori of libertarian uh, property rights. Uh, what, we mean by that, what we mean by that is, of course, uh, a priori of self-ownership and property rights to external, mm, uh, uh, to external uh, resources. Uh, so this is the original formulation of, uh, of, Hoppe argument, of Hoppe's argument. And mm, I think uh, the last move that I would like to make in my in my lecture is to uh, focus now on some of the main criticisms that uh, have been presented in the literature uh, um, against argumentation ethics. So one of the uh, main arguments that uh, uh, was presented uh, says, Hoppe did not prove that it would be contradictory to argue that our interlocutor does not own his body. At most, he proved that it would be contradictory to argue that our interlocutor does not own these body parts that are essential for engaging in argumentation. For example, uh, mouth, brain, uh, maybe also some other body parts, etc. But since, for example, legs or arms are not, uh, um, are not essential for arguing, although, as you can see, in my case, they are essential, <laughs> so, so, uh, because they are not essential for arguing, there would be no contradiction in saying that our interlocutor's legs are not his property. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would be inclined to say that this criticism uh, misfires. And we can see uh, why, uh, if we come back to the way the argument was presented. Uh, I don't really think that Hoppe is making any such point uh, about essential parts uh, of, of body that are engaged in the argumentation. Note that Hoppe's argument does not say anything about body parts essential or inessential for argumentation. Right? We've just seen the Hoppe's point. His argument only says that one ought to abstain from using violence in order to argue, or in order to solve the initial, arg uh, the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation. Uh, and obviously, injuring, some injuring someone's legs or someone's uh, arms would uh, undeniably constitute a violent action, and so would put an end to an argumentative and peaceful ways of solving disagreements and conflicts. Uh, so in order to argue, one ought to abstain from using violence against all body parts, essential and inessential. 
right? And this is this, this, is this point that I was hint, uh, hinting at uh, during my presentation of Hopper's argument, that uh, sometimes he is charged with this charge that uh, he does not distinguish uh, clearly between uh, what is a right uh, of property uh, from uh, what is uh, basically a fact of controlling uh, some resource. Uh, well, th the truth is that his formulation of argumentation ethics uh, mm, was basically changing over the years. So if we, if we take his first writings, it will be formulated slightly differently than it was formulated in 2016. But I think that charitable interpretation of what he was, uh, what he was saying uh, uh, would uh, basically require that we interpret his argumentation as, as an, uh, uh, his argument as an argument about uh, property rights. And property rights, uh, uh, um, um, I would say, have to be understood in terms of our uh, normative protection against other people using physical force against us, right? Or what we call interference with our uh, enjoyment of, uh, of particular, particular resources. So this is a very ar a different argument, uh, it, it, and it seems to me not to be really susceptible to this sort of, this sort of criticism. Well, the second uh, sort of uh, mm, critique that has been presented in the literature against argumentation ethics uh, says that the first sentence is actually a quotation. One is not necessarily the rightful owner of a piece of property, even if control of it is necessary in a debate over its ownership. Uh, well, as I understand, as I understand this argument, it says that uh, from the fact that Peter's control of a given resource, in this case Peter's body, is necessary for Peter in order to engage in argumentation, it does not follow that Peter has own ownership rights to Peter's body. Well, this is true as as, as far as it goes. Uh, mm, this also might be a good argument uh, for some other reasons that uh, we basically are not really able to present any argument or any argumentation if we uh, don't have a at least par partial control of our uh, body. But again, uh, this kind of argument seems to me uh, to misfire against the uh, proper formulation of Hopper's uh, argumentation ethics argument. Because, uh, uh, again, Hopper does not rely on any, any such claims. Uh, Hopper does not say in my opinion, that because use or control of a Peter's body is necessary for Peter to argue, therefore Peter owns his body. This is not the argument as I understand it. The argument seems to me to be that because uh, Peter ought to abstain from using violence against Paul in order to solve the initial disagreement in the course of argumentation, therefore Paul not Peter, but therefore Paul has rights against violence being used against him, uh, rights that we are properly call self-ownership rights. And these rights are to Paul's body, not to Peter's body. And, but because argumentation is an exchange, then the same argument would operate uh, on the part of Paul, let's say, uh, in favor of Peter. But But the argument would be made in a very different way. So the reasoning would be because let's say that, that I'm now arguing with you, because I want to solve our initial disagreement about whether argumentation ethics is a sound philosophy or not, uh, in the course of argumentation, uh, therefore I ought to abstain from using violence against you, that would uh, result in the conclusion that you have rights that violence is not used against you. That is, you have rights that we are properly call self-ownership rights. So far, I would not say anything about my rights. And only because you would be engaging in the argumentation with me, then that would constitute sort of, a, or would uh, grant the recognition of uh, rights on my part. Whereas this criticism seems to me to be, uh, to be uh, uh, suggesting that the argument operates in a way, uh, in the following way, that because for me to make an argument, I have to, uh, have a control or use of my body, otherwise that would be impossible. Therefore, I have property rights to my body. I would, uh, uh, I would suggest that this is uh, uh, not the way that is the, the, the way uh, Hopper's argument works, in my opinion, is uh, 
um, or at least a charitable interpretation of this argument would be uh, would be different. Would be, th I guess, this one I suggested uh, in my uh, reading of this argument. Well, another criticism is that the Hoppe's argument is refuted by experience. Uh, since many slaves argued with each other and with the masters, and obviously slaves don't have uh, property rights to their bodies. Well, mm, I think, again, that this criticism does not really uh, reach uh, its goal, its target, uh, because uh, Hopper's argument, as, as we could, uh, could see, uh, is about uh, uh, justifying or justification of uh, specific norms. So he, th that's the argument that we would be willing to call an argument about moral rights or natural rights, uh, if you will. Whereas this criticism, uh, in the form as it is presented, seems to me to be talking about legal rights or what we would call positive rights. Obviously, that it's not really difficult to imagine that the question about uh, moral rights, that is, rights that are, that are justified uh, rationally or that are justified by reason, uh, are v might be very different from rights that are backed up with sanction and specifically with the state sanction. Uh, they, they don't have to overlap and very often they don't overlap. I would say in majority of cases they don't, they don't overlap, right? Uh, so uh, this argument as it is presented does not seem to me to be reaching the target, which is basically uh, a Hoppe's, uh, uh, Hoppe's point. Uh, Okay, so we have four minutes left. I have some further criticisms, but maybe I will stop here uh, to take questions. I have a question. Um, so, one other criticism that, if I remember correctly, and you correct me on this because I may be misremembering, uh, but I believe Hoppe concedes it, is that what you can demonstrate from argumentation ethics of self ownership, you can't demonstrate property rights in the law. It says, like, the idea of mixing labor with property is something that, if I, I believe he concedes, we just kind of have to accept it's more consequential. It, it's, a, it's a consequentialist argument, right? So if we can't derive physical property rights from self-ownership a priori, then it seems like if we accept your arguments in your presentation, you're saying that like a actual like physical initiations of violence are precluded, but we can't preclude a priori things like um, fraud, right? Or even just things like breaking into somebody's house and stealing from them. So those property rights, if they can't be shown a priori, then it seems like that's, that's almost, even if it doesn't disprove his argument, it seems that it, it relegates the significance of it to a much lower level. What do you think? Uh, yeah, that's that's a very good question, or maybe I should have said a very good set of questions. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, and thank you for that. I would, I would, uh, I, I think I would uh, agree with some points uh, that uh, probably, well, that might be the case, and some phil uh, philosophers would argue that it is the case that derivation of uh, property rights to external resources from the otherwise uh, obvious or self-evident or whatever uh, self-ownership principle might uh, be susceptible to different sorts of criticisms and that the reasoning in the Lockean tradition is not necessarily uh, uh, a you know, purely logical derivation. So, for instance, such an argument is made by uh, Hiller uh, Steiner in his uh, Nessian Rights and also other, other um, philosophers. Uh, mm, but I would disagree with this part when you suggested that this derivation would be consequentialist. I think, as I understand Lockean position, and may maybe one more remark, I don't really think that uh, it, uh, we, are, mm, we can be sure that Hopper would subscribe to the Lockean uh, uh, a labor theory of original appropriation. Sometimes he suggests, uh, specifically in earlier writings, that uh, mm, he's so, sort of a friend of uh, a labor theory of first acquisition, whereas in, uh, in later writings, like in this lecture 2016, he uh, explicitly talks about the uh, principle of first possessions. 
And, and these are two different theories of first acquisition, right? So one is Lockean, another is, I think, is a, a Roman. So Romans believed that we acquire uh, originally uh, property rights to external resources by taking first possession of these resources. But uh, setting this uh, controversy aside and coming back to my main point, I would say that it does not, lock in tradition now, it does not seem to me to be consequential, uh, consequentialist. Uh, as I understand this, uh, this argument, it looks like that. We own our bodies, which, uh, if Hope is right, has been proved uh, apodictically and a priori. And uh, by mixing our labor with uh, um, external resources, what we are doing, we are basically... Uh, attaching parts of our body to the resource because labor is nothing else than a matter of our body transformed into energy. Uh, so uh, my uh, personal belief is there's nothing problematic about the idea of owning one's labor, although I know some uh, scholars uh, think that this idea should be uh, jettisoned. Uh, because I think that labor is nothing else, there's nothing else than our, the matter of our body uh, transformed into energy and attached to something. And now, if someone comes and takes this resource from us, he will inevitably take with it something, take with it something that undeniably and by definition was our property. So he will take this part of our body that was attached or, uh, to these resources or, or, or with which these resources were infused. So he will commit a theft. So it seems to me to be deontological uh, reasoning rather than and stemming the sort of derivation, uh, so, sort of material deduction from the principles of ownership than consequentialist argument. Although consequential argument independently can be, of, of course, made uh, for the same purpose. So, Professor, what would happen if this... Uh, I'm taking the discussion a little bit uh, away from what the presentation was about, because we were talking here about uh, originary property over, over uh, factors of production. So what will happen if this, is, if this discussion took place in a hypothetical future free society where most likely most property rights wouldn't have been uh, originary due to like all the misallocation of resources that, that, that had occurred during the course of time, you know? Yes. So, well, you know, I guess uh, that's that, that's that's a very profound question and, and difficult to answer. Frankly, I, I I don't know whether I can answer it. I will just point out that uh, in countries like Poland, for instance, that were uh, coming through a transformation from communism to uh, so-called uh, partly at least free society, uh, we all face these problems, right? So. Uh, because everything was so uh, intertwined and uh, difficult really to uh, put our fingers on, uh, you know, who should own what, then how to really deal with this transformation? Uh, well, that's a very tough question, although I think this question is categori categorically different than uh, purely philosophical questions, because we know what are true principles, we know how to derive uh, mm, 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 uh, other principles from them or other theorems from them. Now only the question is how to learn uh, in an uh, empirical situation, in a specific case, how these principles apply to a specific case. This seems to me not to be a philosophical question. Uh, it looks like cybernetics maybe more and uh, for, for judges. Uh, on the free market, judges would have to decide such. That may require like actually entrepreneurial like ability of people in the future like, to accommodate that and make it like as sound as it would be, right? Might be, yeah. Might be. I don't know whether we have time for any other questions, rather not. So uh, after the lecture, I'm available to you. Uh, thank you very much.